नमस्कार इन दिस सीरीज अवर नेक्स्ट टॉपिक इज फ्लो प्लीज रीड द फॉलोइंग कोर्ट्स केयरफुली माई माइंड इज नॉट वॉन्ड्रिंग आई एम टोटली इन्वॉल्व इन वट आई एम डूइंग एंड आई एम नॉट थिंकिंग ऑफ एनी थिंग एल्स माई बॉडी फील्स गुड द वर्ल्ड सीन्स टू बी कट ऑफ फ्रॉम मी आई एम लेस अवेयर ऑफ माई सेल्फ एंड माई प्रॉब्लम्स माई कंसनट्रेशन इज लाइक ब्रीदिंग आई नेवर थिंक ऑफ इट वेन आई स्टार्ट आई रियली डू सेट आउट ऑफ द वर्ल्ड आई एम सो इन्वॉल्व इन वट आई एम डूइंग I don't see myself as separate from what I am doing. I have been challenged, but I believe that my skills will allow me to meet the challenge. I know what I want to achieve, how good I am performing and experience a sense of control during activity. Have you ever felt similar experiences? If yes, please write the name of the activity. and during that activity you were experiencing flow so let's know what flow is however this experience is like describing taste of rasgulla uh, you know there is difference between taste or experience of rasgulla or description in words of taste of rasgulla so that's why these are two things these are actually inbuilt or experiential activities and we are trying to address or define these experiential activities with the help of uh, words so somewhere actually we are not able to describe it exactly but still there are various scholars who have tried to define the concept of flow chick said me hi is leader in this field his introduction in one of the international positive psychology association conferences was he has three sons two sons and third son is flow so whole life he has worked on this concept the concept of flow can be defined with various experiences like providing an understanding of experiences during which individuals are fully involved in the present moment so during this activity you are fully involved in the present moment at this time we have optimal experience and optimal development means best ideal or peak level of experiences we have during this process this activity is single mindedly disregarding hunger fatigue or discomfort during this process or during this activity we feel intrinsically motivated or autotelic activity we count it activity rewarding in and of itself so it's autotelic activity means goal itself is rewarding activity it means when we are in the process of flow we are in the present neither in the past nor in the future during this process we experience peak level best level ideal level experiences during this period there is no uh, distraction at all due to hunger thirst uh, fatigue discomfort or any other distractors we don't have during this process activity itself is a motivation so these are the characteristics of flow significant research has been conducted on intrinsic motivation and itself it's a goal and it's a process which motivate us to perform certain activities conditions of enjoyment by interviewing like uh, chess players rock climbers dancers and others who emphasized enjoying as the main reason for pursuing an activity so doing work itself is a reward and they don't need uh, external rewards doing these activities themselves are rewarding for them sense that one is engaging in challenges at a level that is appropriate to one's capabilities so they have similar capacities or capabilities which are required for this situation or challenge for this task so that way your capacities and challenges are well matched here next point is subjective state of flow with the following circumstances during the subjective state of flow you experience clear proximal goals and immediate feedback about the progress that is being made so during this period we know what are our goals and we are able to get immediate feedback whenever is required so we know in which direction our progress is going on intense and focused concentration on what one is doing in the present moment so focused focused concentration we have and full attention in present moment 
sense that one can control one's actions. So, we know in which direction our actions are going on and we are able to control them and that power or that uh, you know sense we have during this activity. Distortion of temporal experiences that is next subjective state typically a sense that time has passed faster than normal or maybe slower than normal. So, somehow we have distortion of temporal experiences. When in flow the individual operates at full capacity, the state is one of dynamic balanced activity. A merging of action and awareness, you do not have separate awareness, action itself is part of your awareness. So, loss of reflective sense consciousness we have during this period, loss of awareness of oneself as a social actor, sense that one can control one action that is another point during this process, experience of the activity as intrinsically rewarding. Chick sent me high highlighted individual differences in people experiencing flow and considered that people with autotelic personality were more prone to experiencing flow. He observed that there are individual differences, some of us have higher level of flow because of autotelic personality or we have higher level of intrinsic motivation and activities themselves are a part of our uh, reward or we want to do. So, we have internal locus of control or intrinsic motivation that is why we take interest in such kind of activities. So, intrinsically motivated or autotelic activities we like to do and some of us like to do more as compared to others and that is why they experience higher level of flow. Those type of personalities are called autotelic personalities. Autotelic personality has shown higher self esteem, able to resist distractors, less anxiety and intrinsically motivated as Jackson and Roberts in 1992 reported in their research. A person who is never bored, seldom anxious, involved with what goes on and in flow most of the time may be said to have an autotelic self. So, there are some people who have higher level of autotelic self, autotelic personality or they experience higher level of flow as compared to other people. Now, next point is most widely accepted nature of flow is based on 9 dimensions as stated by Mihai in 1990 and 1993. So, flow has been described with these 9 dimensions which are being used in its uh, explanation as well as in psychological test. First dimension is challenge skill balance. In flow, there is a feeling of balance between the demands of the situation and personal skills and there is well balanced relationship between these challenges and skills. For example, if you have uh, 120 IQ and demand of this activity is about 120 IQ only. So, in this situation your abilities as well as challenges of these situations are matching with each other and that is why you have balanced level. Second is action awareness merging. Involving is so deep that there is a feeling of automaticity about one's actions and awareness and actions are not two, these are merging with each other during this process. Third dimension is clear goals, a feeling of certainty about what one is going to do. So, clear goals direction you have in which direction your activity is going on, clear cut feedback about it. So, unambiguous feedback is the fourth dimension. Immediate and clear feedback is received, confirming feelings that everything is going according to the plan. Fifth dimension is concentration on task at hand, a feeling of being really focused that is fifth dimension. Sixth is sense of control, the distinctive characteristics of this feeling in the flow state is that it happens without conscious efforts. So, you are not doing extra efforts that is your natural process to have uh, involvement in this activity. Loss of self consciousness is the seventh dimension, concern for the self disappearance as the person becomes one with the activity. So, highly connected with the activity and you do not have uh, you know separate self consciousness during this process because you are fully involved in this ongoing activity. Eighth one is transformation of time. Time can be seen 
as passing more quickly or maybe more slowly or there may be a complete lack of awareness of the passing of time. So, there is distortion or there is transformation of time not exactly you are feeling whatever it is. Ninth dimension is autotelic experience. Csikszentmihalyi describes this as the end result of being in flow, a feeling of doing something for its own sake with no expectations of future reward or benefit. So, such kind of experiences automatically or uh, you know themselves are rewarding activity and you are not expecting certain rewards from outside or from future or some other benefits for this activity. Flow can be assessed with various methods and uh, we have psychological test as well as some other techniques to assess or to measure flow level. Because in psychology our interest is to study individual differences on different constructs in psychology like flow, how it is different in different people, hope, how it is different in different people, uh, optimism, how its level is different in different people. So, that is why assessment or measurement of these constructs are really important for us for assessing or measuring flow there are various ways. One is interviews, one can have interviews as per their research questions and can be used structured interviews, unstructured interviews or maybe semi-structured or pattern interviews as per their uh, research requirement. However, we know semi-structured interviews are highlighted or are supported more uh, as compared to structured and unstructured interviews because semi-structured interview is the middle path and has lesser limitations. Second may be certain questionnaires or paper and pencil measures which I will discuss in next slide. Along with this there is one another technique or another assessment tool that is experience sampling method. The introduction of experience sampling method with its goal of studying individuals subjective experiences in their natural settings made it possible to test the theory of flow. And uh, in this method we take samples from the stream of actual everyday experiences. It is unlike diaries or time budgets the use of ESM or experience sampling method from the beginning focused on the sampling not only on the activities, but also measuring the behavior, thoughts and feelings of the participants throughout the selected activity. Unlike diaries and uh, you know time budgets, experience sampling or data is collected during the activity going on. For example, during uh, say coding task at computer, some pop ups are visible to respond for experience sampling. So, in this case uh, the activity is going on and during the activity some pop ups came up and you have to respond as once uh, you know see these questions and during activity without disturbing you there are some questions which you are answering. So, during this period we are uh, experiencing or we are collecting data on your thoughts, on your feelings, on your emotions as well as uh, you know other uh, parameters which we want to collect here through questions during the activity. So, uh, not only activity focus uh, information we get, but we get information about your behavior, about your thoughts, about your feelings during this activity. And then we try to understand flow process by measuring or by uh, analyzing data on behavior, on thoughts and feelings which we have collected during the particular activity. Most of the time we use technology, for example, mobile, certain ways to collect data on computer or some other gadgets which help us to collect data by using experience sampling method. When we talk about psychological test, I think let us take example of uh, one test which is quite famous in psychology to measure flow that is Jackson's psychological test. He has developed a scale by considering all these multi dimensions and uh, he has developed two type of scales. One the flow state scale and dispositional flow scale is the another one. These are two self report instruments designed to assess flow experiences from the nine dimensions. First of all let us know about these nine dimensions and then difference between dispositional flow scale and the flow state scale. These nine dimensions as I discussed previously the same one. These nine dimensions are action awareness, merging challenge skill balance, 
clear goals, unambiguous feedback, total concentration on the task at hand, sense of control, loss of self consciousness, transformation of time and autotelic experience. As I discuss difference between state and dispositional factors, you can easily understand difference between two. In terms of flow scale, the flow state scale means in the present situation. Activities may be sports activities, you know music related activities, computer related tasks or certain other activities, but situation focused flow we are interested to study. On the other hand, when we are saying dispositional flow scale, personal factors, traits or relatively stable patterns in our behavior we are interested to study and then the questions are what kind of usual response you have on these nine dimensions. On the other hand, when we are saying situation oriented or states scales, then our instruction would be a little bit different. For example, please answer the following questions in relation to your experience in the event or activity just completed or during the activity of name of that activity. So, in this case when we say state the flow state scale, then we want to study your flow during particular activity or activity which you have just completed and our interest is to study flow in that particular activity. On the other hand, in dispositional psychological test or in dispositional scales, we study your usual responses, your habitual responses or pattern in your personality to provide certain responses that is our interest. In some cases, some psychologists have highlighted unidimensional scale. When these dimensions are experienced together, flow is thought to occur. It helps to facilitate a concise assessment of the global flow construct. So, in this case our objective is to study super factor that is flow and flow has combination of these 9 dimensions. In our study also we observed that flow can be facilitated or can be studied as an unidimensional factor. The research finding of our study supported the results of an unidimensional scale in Indian setting. We know our behavior is interaction of personal factors and environmental factors. Similarly, for flow importance of personal factors and environmental factors we have. And we know for fostering flow we should give importance to personal factors as well as to in environmental factors. And uh, two type of activities or two type of programs we could have. Number one, finding and shaping activities and environments that are more conducive to flow experiences. So, we want to focus on those activities as well as environmental situations which help us to facilitate flow. Second is identifying personal characteristics and attention skills that can be twisted to make flow more likely. So, we may facilitate such kind of factors in our personality which help us to have higher level of flow. We had one research uh, and had qualitative data. We observed participants responses and found that they experience flow in various activities. In this research, we observed that they highlighted on creative activities. 34.79 percent participants observed that during creative activities like listening to music, singing songs, dramatics, dancing, they experience flow. In sports activities, 24.07 percent people experience that they experience flow during football, swimming, chess, uh, badminton, table tennis, etc. For academic activities, some of them 19.48 percent, they said enjoying studying, they feel actually flow during academic activities. Entertainment was highlighted by them, 3.06 percent said during watching TV they experienced flow. Computer related activities also highlighted by 5.25 percent uh, participants, they said online gaming, coding, programming, such kind of activities have uh, experience of flow for them. Extracurricular activities similarly 13.35 percent people observed certain extracurricular activities like involvement with NGO activities. 
participating in various debates, quizzes, they experienced flow. So, when we ask when do you feel flow, by providing explanation of flow, they observed that during creative activities, during sports, during academic, during entertainment, during computer related activities and extracurricular activities, they experience flow in, in these situations. We have certain models for understanding flow. For understanding flow, most important factors are challenges versus skills. Are these balanced or are these not balanced? If these are balanced, then we have certain kind of patterns in our activities or responses in our activities. On the other hand, in imbalanced, we may be anxious or bored. Let us understand one by one all these four positions when we talk about challenge and skills patterns. So, when challenge outweigh skills, anxiety is predicted. It means your challenges are high and your skills are low. So, in that situation you will feel anxious. Second one is when skills outweigh challenges, relaxation closely followed by boredom is predicted. So, if your skills are too high, but challenges are low, then this is easy to do and that is why you are not much involved in this activity and feeling bored. If you have low level of skills as well as challenges, then you will experience apathy, uninterested, unconcerned or unresponsive you would feel during this process. On the other hand, the fourth one which is the best one, if you have high level of challenges as well as high skills you have, then you experience flow and uh, during this period that is your best performance you would be having in that activity. I think that is quite clear. So, in some cases we may feel anxious, we may feel bored and if both are low then apathy may be there. On the other hand, if both of them are quite high, then only we feel flow. Similarly, same model with another explanation, but it is with the same meaning. This is our flow stream. On the other hand, this side we may have anxiety and this side we have boring or boredom. So, flow optimal experiences usually involve a fine balance between one's ability to act and the available opportunities for action. If challenges are too high, one gets frustrated, worried and then eventually anxious. If challenges are too low relatively to one's skills, one gets relaxed then bored. If both challenges and skills are perceived to be low, one may become apathetic or uninterested. On the other hand, if both of them are high, then you experience flow. So, like that in combination of skill and challenge, you may have various state of mind boredom, apathy, worry, anxiety, arousal, relaxation, control and flow. Another very interesting model which is again related to flow as well as our performance and stress. This is Yuck's Dotson model and this model is quite relevant here to discuss that is why I have included in this slide. It is based on the subjective challenges and subjective skills not objective one. What do you think that is your subjective feeling about it? So, uh, your feeling has significant role uh, to understand stress as well as flow that influence the quality of a person's experience. So, person aptitude base is there and in this case if you just see this side the performance scale and this side that is stress. And this model saying that if you have quite low level of stress or maybe you know achievement motivation, then you could feel sleepy and you are not motivated at all to do the work and you are quite sluggish. So, your performance is quite low. On the other hand, if your optimal level is normal and can say you stress, stress level which is required for best performance is available, then you have best level of performance. On the other hand, if your stress is increasing and this stress is quite high, then you may feel anxious or disoriented and that is why your performance can deteriorate again. So, if uh, your stress level is too high, then again your performance level is low and if you have observed some people, they are not able to even show their own potentiality, their own performance level. It is because uh, during this process, they might chalk under pressure, 
because now they have very high level of stress which is hampering their uh, performance and that is why they have quite low of performance. So, we can actually define this area chalked under pressure and person is not able to show his performance because of too high level of stress. So, that is why a too high level of stress as well as too low level of stress both are hampering performance. Optimal level of stress is facilitating best level of performance. Similarly, same model, same explanation just to show little bit clear view about it. Here is a board because calm as well as uh, you know feeling sluggish not involved in the performance. So, because of uh, low level of stress. On the other hand energized focused work feels effortless because uh, you have optimal level of stress or stress which is facilitating your performance that level you have and that is why best performance. On the other hand if it is too high stress then that is converted in distress and then fatigue exhaustion, health related problems, boredom and burnout we may experience. So, that is why scholar have focused on the use stress, optimal level of stress which is facilitating our performance as well as our well being. Another model also talking about three levels or three zones of conditions for flow. Number one is the comfort zone where you have a comfortable balance between challenges skills. Second level is stretch zone in which you can stretch your skills to meet those challenges and this zone motivate us to perform better. On the other hand third may be panic zone. In this zone you are not able to meet your uh, requirements and that is why you may have severe problems. So, comfort zone where you have best match of challenge and skills. Sketch zone, your challenges are just above the skills and you can stress yourself. Panic zone, if challenges level is beyond your skills and it is an alarming stress and may be harmful for you. Next important point here is how flow is correlated with other variables or other constructs or factors. It is quite close to mindfulness as well as savoring. Savoring focus on the positive. Savoring means when we uh, enjoy certain activities, focus on positive experiences in the past, present or future and it shares certain percentage of variance, it is correlated with flow. On the other hand mindfulness, mindfulness means focus on the present. I will cover this topic in the next class as well as I will revisit correlation between flow and mindfulness why it is so once you would be knowing mindfulness in detail. Mindfulness means deliberate, non-judgmental, attention to what is happening in the present moment. On the other end flow you know full involvement in what one is doing with loss of self-consciousness and these three are correlated with each other but they are not same which I will discuss later in next slides also. So, flow and mindfulness similarities as well as differences let us discuss uh, one by one. When we talk about similarities flow total focus on the task at hand and mindfulness awareness to one's here and now experiences. Similarities are positive psychology concepts dating back to 1970s we have borrowed this concept from psychological studies long history in spiritual and yoga traditions and included in psychology in 1970s. Mindfulness has long history in spiritual and yoga traditions, uh, it is from Buddhism and included in psychology in 1970s. Clear conceptual model both side, strong research basis now in psychology we have and both of them are learnt experiences. When we talk about their differences, they are highly correlated with each other, but still there are some differences between two. Instructions such as live in the here and now and focus on the present moment have been linked to the psychology of peak performances in sports. So, live in the here and now and focus on the present moment, these are instructions for mindfulness and these mindfulness instructions or processes have been highlighted for best performances in the sports. Being aware of and accepting of our experience and staying in the present uh, creates a mindset that facilitates flow. So, 
mindfulness processes also facilitating flow processes, creating an environment of appropriate challenge skill balance and tuning to feedback will enhance the potential for being mindfulness and experience flow. So, both of them are highly correlated with each other. However, if we talk about the differences, mindfulness focus on the present, on the other hand flow focus on the activity. Now, next point is what are the benefits of flow, why we are focusing much on flow. Flow is highly correlated with happiness, both subjective and psychological well-being as Csikszent Mihai reported in his study. Better coping, focus one of the prerequisites of flow is associated with better emotion regulation, a crucial skill when coping with negative emotions and memories. So, that is helpful to have uh, emotional regulation. Flow focuses your attention on what is important and positive. Flow can lead to improved performance. Flow can accelerate uh, learning and skill development. Flow can increase your productivity. Flow teaches you to rise to challenges. Flow increases enjoyment and creativity. Flow is the ultimate you stress experience or optimal level of stress experience. So, flow is highly correlated with best performance and that is why we psychologists, we positive psychologists taking interest in this construct. Chiksen Mihai also focused on the flow and the secret of happiness. He stated that the happiest people spend much time in a state of flow, the state in which people are so involved in an activity that nothing else seems to matter. The experience itself is so enjoyable that people will do it even at great cost for the sheer sake of doing it. He has number of TED talks to define flow as well as its benefits. I have selected for you his talk, Flow the Secret of Happiness. I hope you will enjoy this talk. Thank you very much. I grew up in Europe and uh, World War II caught me when I was between 7 and 10 years old and uh, I realized how few of the grown-ups that I knew were able to withstand the uh, uh, tragedies that the war uh, visited on them, how few of them could uh, even resemble a normal uh, contented, satisfied, happy life once their uh, uh, job, their home, their security was uh, destroyed by the war. So I became interested in understanding uh, what uh, contributed to a life that uh, was worth living. And I tried as a child, uh, as a teenager, to read philosophy and to get involved in art and uh, religion and, and many other ways that I could see as a possible answer to that question. And uh, finally I ended up um, encountering psychology by chance. Actually I, I was at a ski resort in Switzerland without any money to actually enjoy myself because the the, uh, the snow had melted and there was, I didn't have money to go to a movie, but I found that um, on the, uh, reading the newspapers that there was to be a, a presentation uh, by someone in, in a place that uh, s seemed in the center of Zurich. And uh, it was um, about flying saucers he was going to talk and I thought, well, since I can't go to the movies, at least I will go uh, for free to listen to Flying Saucers. And the man uh, who talked uh, at that uh, evening uh, lecture uh, was very interesting. And it actually, instead of talking about little green man, he talked about how the psyche of the Europeans had been traumatized by the war and now they are projecting flying saucers into the sky kind of as a 
He talked about how the mandalas of uh, ancient Hindu religion were kind of projected into the sky as an attempt to regain some f sense of order after the chaos of war. And this seemed very interesting to me, and I started reading his books uh, after that lecture, and that was Carl Jung, whose, whose uh, name or work I, I had no idea about. Then I came to this country to study psychology, and uh, I started trying to understand the, these roots of happiness. This is a typical result that many people have uh, presented, and there are many variations on it. But this, for instance, shows that about 30% of the people surveyed in the United States since 1956 say that their life is very happy. And that hasn't changed at all, whereas the personal income on a scale that has been held constant to accommodate for inflation has more than doubled, almost tripled in that period. But you find essentially the same results, namely that after a certain basic point, which corresponds more or less to just a few thousand dollars above the minimum poverty level, increases in material well-being don't seem to affect how happy people are. And in fact, you can find that um, the lack of basic resources, material resources, contributes to unhappiness, but the uh, increase in uh, material resources do not increase happiness. So my research has been focused more on after uh, finding out these things that actually uh, corresponded to my own experience, I tried to understand now where in everyday life, in our normal experience, do we, do we feel really happy? And to start that, uh, those studies about 40 years ago, I began to look at uh, creative people, first artists, then scientists, and so forth, trying to understand what made them uh, feel that uh, it was worth uh, essentially spending their life doing things for which many of them didn't expect either fame or fortune, but which made their life meaningful and worth uh, doing. This was one of the leading composers of American music back in the 70s, and the interview was 40 pages long, but this little excerpt is a very good summary of what he was saying during the um, interview, and it describes how he feels when composing is going well. And he starts by describing it as an ecstatic state. Now, ecstasy in Greek meant simply to stand to the side of something. And then it became um, essentially a, an analogy for a mental state where you feel that you're not doing your ordinary everyday routines. So ecstasy is essentially a stepping into an alternative uh, reality. And it's interesting, if you think about it, how when we think about the civilizations that we look up to as having been pinnacles of human achievement, whether it's China, Greece, in, uh, Hindu civilization, or the Mayas, or Egyptians, what we know about them is really about their ecstasies, not about their everyday life. We know the temples they built, so where people could come to experience a different reality. We know about the circuses, the arenas, sport arenas, the theaters. These are the uh, remains of civilizations, and they are the places that people went to experience life in a more concentrated, more uh, ordered uh, form. Now, this man doesn't need to go to a place like this, which is also this place, uh, this arena, which is built like a Greek amphitheater, is a place for ecstasy also. We are participating in a reality which is different from that of everyday life that we are used to. But this man doesn't need to go to there. He needs just a piece of paper 
where he can put down little marks. And as he does that, he can imagine uh, sounds that had not existed before in that particular combination. So when, once he gets to that point of beginning to create, like Jennifer did in her improvisation, a, a new reality, that is a moment of ecstasy. He enters that different reality. Now, he says also that this is so intense an experience that it feels almost as if it didn't exist. And that sounds like um, a kind of a romantic exaggeration. But actually, our nervous system is incapable of processing more than about 110 bits of information per second. And in order to hear me and understand what I'm saying, you need to process about 60 bits per second. That's why you can't hear more than two people. You can't understand more than two people talking to you. Well, in, when you are really involved in this um, uh, completely engaging process of creating something new, as this man does, he doesn't have enough attention left over to monitor how his body feels or his problems at home. He can't feel even that he's hungry or tired. His body disappears, his identity uh, disappears from his consciousness because he doesn't have enough attention, like none of us do, to really do well something that requires a lot of concentration and at the same time to feel that he exists. So existence temporarily suspended. And he says that his hand seems to be moving by itself. Now, I could, uh, I could look at my hand for two weeks and I wouldn't feel any awe and wonder because <laughs> I can't compose. But, so what he's not telling you here, but in other parts of the interview is that Obviously, this uh, automatic, spontaneous uh, process that he's describing can only happen to someone who is very well trained and who has developed technique. And in, uh, it has become a kind of a truism in the study of creativity that you can't be creating anything with less than 10 years uh, of uh, technical knowledge immersion in a, in a particular field. Whether it's mathematics or music, it takes that long to be able to, uh, to uh, begin to change something in a way that it's better than what was there before. Now, when that happens, he says, the music just flows out. And because all of these people I started interviewing, this was an interview which is over 30 years old. Um, so many of the people described this as a spontaneous flow that I call this um, type of experience the flow experience. And it happens in different realms. For instance, a poet describes it in this form. This is by a student of mine who interviewed some of the leading writers and poets in the United States. And it describes the same effortless, spontaneous feeling that you get when you enter into this ecstatic state. This poet describes it as opening a door that floats up in the sky. Very similar description to what Albert Einstein gave as to how he imagined the forces of relati uh, relativity when he was struggling with trying to understand how it worked. Um, but it happens in other activities. For instance, this is another student of mine, Susan Jackson from Australia, who did work with some of the leading athletes in the world. And you see here in this description of an Olympic skater, the same essential description of the phenomenology of the inner state of the person. You don't think it goes automatically. You merge yourself with the music and so forth. It happens also actually in the most recent book I wrote called Good Business, where I interviewed some of the CEOs who have been nominated by their peers as being both very successful 
and very ethical, very socially responsible. You see that these people define success as something that helps others and at the same time makes you feel happy as you are working at it. And like all of these successful and uh, responsible CEOs say, um, you can't have just one of these things to, to be successful. Um, uh, if you want a meaningful job and successful job, Anita Radic is another one of these CEOs we interviewed. She is the founder of Body Shop, the cosmetic, kind of natural cosmetic thing. It's kind of a passion that comes from doing the best and having flow while you're working. This is an interesting little quote from Masaru Ibuka, who was, at that time, starting out Sony without any money, without a product. They didn't have a product, they didn't have anything, but they had an idea. And the idea he had was to establish a place of work where engineers can feel the joy of technological innovation, be aware of their mission to society, and work to their heart's content. I couldn't improve on this as a good example of how flow enters the workplace. Now, when we do studies, we have, with other uh, colleagues around the world, done over 8,000 interviews of people from Dominican monks to uh, blind nuns to Himalayan climbers to Navajo shepherds who enjoy their work. And regardless of the culture, regardless of education or, or whatever, there are these seven conditions that seem to be there when a person is in flow. There's this focus that once it becomes intense, leads a sense of ecstasy, a sense of clarity. You know exactly what you want to do from one moment to the other. You get immediate feedback. You know that what you need to do is possible to do, even though difficult. And sense of time disappears. You forget yourself. You feel part of something larger. And once those conditions are present, what you're doing becomes worth doing for its own sake. In our studies, we represent the everyday life of people in this simple scheme, and we can measure this very precisely, actually, because we give people electronic pagers that go off 10 times a day, and whenever they go off, you say what you're doing, how you feel, um, where you are, what you're thinking about. And two things that we measure is the amount of challenge people experience at that moment and the amount of skills that they feel they have at that moment. So for each person, we can establish an average, which is the center of the diagram. That would be your mean level of challenge and skill, which will be different from that of anybody else. But you have a kind of a set point there, which would be in the middle. If we know what that set point is, we can predict fairly accurately when you will be in flow, and it will be when your challenges are higher than average and skills are higher than average. And you may be doing things very differently from other people, but for everyone, that flow channel, that area there, will be when you are doing what you really like to do. Play the piano, probably. Be with your best friend. Perhaps work, if work is what provides flow for you. And then the other areas become less and less positive. Arousal is still good because you are over-challenged there. Uh, your skills are not quite as high as they should be. But you can move into flow fairly easily by just developing a little more skill. So arousal is the area where most people learn from because that's where they are pushed beyond their comfort zone and that to enter, going back to flow, then they develop higher skills. Control is also a good place to be because there you feel comfortable, but not very excited. It's not very challenging anymore. And if you want to enter flow from control, you have to increase the challenges. So those two are ideal and complementary areas from which flow is easy to go into. The other combinations of challenge and skill become progressively less optimal. Relaxation is fine, you still feel okay, 
boredom begins to be very aversive, and apathy becomes very negative. You don't feel that you're doing anything. You don't use your skills. There's no challenge. Unfortunately, a lot of people's experience is in apathy. Uh, the largest single um, contribu contributor to that experience is watching television. The next one is being in the bathroom sitting. And then um, <laughs> even though sometimes uh, watching television about 7 to 8% of the time is in flow, but that's when you choose a program you really want to watch and you get uh, feedback from it. So the question we are trying to address, and I'm way over time, is how to put more and more of uh, everyday life in that flow channel. And that is the kind of challenge that we are trying to understand. And some of you obviously know that how to do that spontaneously without any advice. But unfortunately, a lot of people don't. And that's what our uh, mandate is, in a way, to do. OK? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.